Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussion Bound. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum, and I am joined by my colleague Paige Taylor, our Learning and Engagement Assistant. Today we are going to be discussing uh, the new fourth edition of The Photograph as Contemporary Art by Charlotte Cotton. Just a few notes before we get started. You probably noticed as you were getting logged on that microphones and video were muted by default. We do welcome you to turn on your video at any time so that we can have a nice conversation with faces instead of still pictures or just names written in black and white. And I'll make it so that you can unmute your microphone in just a moment. For best experience, choose a quiet room and close the door. Please do silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be distracting during the conversation. If you do choose to turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. Use a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. And as we are having a conversation today, make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that we know who you're talking to, who we're talking to. In order to ask questions or make comments throughout the program, you can unmute your microphone when Paige or I ask for questions or comments. You can also type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar and either Paige or I will call on you and unmute your microphone. I can say that it can take a while to get to raise hands, so please do feel free to jump in when you have a question or comment. Finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments. As we were going through the book, Paige and I did come up with a couple of questions for discussion, which we can use or not, but since we don't have a handout to hand to you and we're all at home, we thought we would just go over these questions quickly so that you would have them in mind and Paige and I can refer back to them throughout the hour. First, what were your general impressions of the book? What did you like? What might you have liked to see that wasn't in the book? Two, what do you think about the author's method of describing each section of the book, photographer or photograph? As I was finishing the book, I found a quote, um, I think it was in chapter eight, in an era in which we receive, take, and disseminate, as well as tag, browse, and edit photographic imagery, we are all more invested and more expert in the language of photography than ever before, and we have a greater appreciation for how photography can be a far from neutral or transparent vehicle for bridged and framed moments of real time. I thought that that would be a really good comment for us to discuss. Did any sections of the book uh, corresponding to styles of photography particularly appeal to you? Why? And please do share those. Did any photographs or photographers resonate with you in particular? Share those. A few sections of the book, such as deadpan and moments in history, share similarities with photojournalism. Is there a difference between art photography and photojournalism? Does it matter? Why or why not? discuss the title of the book, The Photograph is Contemporary Art. As I was thinking about the title of the book yesterday, I found it to be very apologetic, and I was wondering if we could even imagine a book entitled Painting is Contemporary Art or Sculpture is Contemporary Art. Um, even after 200 years in existence as a medium, why are people still discussing the validity of photography as an art form? Whether amateurs or professionals, we all engage in photography. Looking at the sections of the book, would you use one of them to describe your own approach to taking photographs? And finally, for the photographers out there, and I know that there are several on this call, were there any particular photographers or photographs in the book that you found interesting or relevant to your own practice or inspirational and to share those? So again, those are just some ideas uh, for us to get the conversation started. Uh, so just starting with what, number one, uh, what were your general reactions uh, to the book? Feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. This is a conversation today. Go ahead, Doris. I 
um, I found it um, uh, uh, not as easy to read from cover to cover, but that was okay. What I liked about it was that I could pick up, I, what I did was I ended up thumbing through the book, um, like a little kid looking for the pictures that I liked, yes. um, found photographs that particularly drew me at that point in time as I was kind of browsing the book and then could really pick up and read about them. So that, um, I guess what I'm saying is what I liked is in a way that um, it, each, each sort of segment stood on its could stand on its own and you could um, appreciate uh, uh, what the what the author was trying to tell you about photography and then once I kind of got into it it's a little easier to go back and then sort of follow the the the, the patterns of the uh, the different styles of photography okay great thanks Doris uh, other just sort of immediate reactions to the book well I agree with Doris okay Billy um it was not an easy read. Uh, uh, I guess my biggest uh, complaint about this book was that a lot of the photographs were very difficult to see because I don't know how many of you have this size, but this is the size that I got. And it could, it, this could be a coffee table book, a big book where you could really see the uh, photographs. So th that was different, particularly when they were referencing different parts of photographs, particularly large, large uh, I'm thinking the ones that were like the collages. Mm -hmm. You really couldn't tell what you were looking at. And some uh, of the room the installations. Hand, right, right. Uh, so, uh, I, and I found myself going online and looking for some of the photographs to see if I could see them, you know, on my computer screen. Um, but I agree with Doris that, you know, my knowledge of the medium of uh, photography in art is very limited. And so I, I really appreciate having the opportunity for the learning and the way that it was categorized. Okay. Make it easier to understand. Tima, I saw your hand up. Yes, it's Tema. Hi. Tema. It's good to virtually meet you. Um, so yeah, I teach photography at ETSU and I was excited to see the conversation because I actually used this book as the textbook for my you know, oh, great. <laughs> I've been doing it even ahead of teaching at U at ETSU because I think it's um, I actually like the, I have a semester long class that's structured I have a corresponding lecture with each chapter of the book. Um, so for example, the storytelling and stage, uh, storytelling and staging and strategies, happenings and performance and so on. And I think it's a really good way for students to get to know different genres of photography outside the kind of, um, you know, landscape, portrait, still life, but think more about the, these various approaches that, that artists working in photography are making. So. It's been a very useful, useful way to structure the class and expose them to this whole vast group of different contemporary photographers. I have a, I have a question for you. Um, since you've used this book before as a textbook, this fourth edition just came out, I think, a couple of months ago. And I know Tim and I had tried to choose this as a book for our book group before, but they kept sort of postponing the the publication of the fourth edition and if you've used this before is it appreciably different from well, the third I actually haven't, edition? Uh, I haven't used the fourth edition yet okay. I'll do it the next time I offer the class but it wasn't it wasn't out the last time I taught the the class so I actually am gonna have to get it and read that that last but they, I know there was a little bit of a difference between the second and the third edition in the sense of adding another chapter at the at the end about um you know, much more sort of conceptual photography. The reason why I ask is because, uh, and I'm sure that you all noticed as she was citing different photographers, always she included their birth date. And I was thinking, gosh, a lot of these photographers are so young. Um, and I was wondering, you know, how much as she's going from second edition to third edition to fourth edition, fourth edition, does she rewrite this book in order to include, you know, new photographers on the scene or new artworks that they've produced? Because it seemed like a lot of really fresh material in right, this right. in this book. Well, that was my understanding of the fourth edition. Like I know, you know, even peers of, of mine that are now appearing in that fourth edition, like Jess Dugan, for example, or Deanna Lawson and mm -hmm. so on. But yeah, I don't know the, um, to, the answer to that. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Go ahead, Tim. So um, I had never, I've never seen the third edition. Uh, I read the second edition. Okay. And it was <laughs> I'm wondering if you, what you read was appreciated. No, no, different. no. no. I really do have this one. And oh, I did, good. And okay, I, good. I did, yeah. And, and um, one major difference is that it's uh, nearly twice as big as the second edition. Interesting. Okay. And uh, it is also um, her, her um, in the second edition, she seemed to be more waxing um, philosophical about, about photography's place within contemporary art. And this seemed to be a lot different from that. Okay. Um, the second edition um, had, you know, far fewer artists represented, obviously. But in this case, um, she just she did a deep dive. And I suspect um, some of it has to do with this particular series um, by this publisher. World um, of Art series. And, and, and I suspect they do this same style in the other parts of that series. They do. And so she had to uh, make adjustments there, but also because photography between <laughs> between second edition and fourth edition uh, has changed a lot. Um, and, you know, Tima, I, I met you some while ago um, <laughs> in Asheville at some event. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> You know, as you as you know, and as most people know, it photography has changed a lot. Um, and uh, and one emphasis she had on in the first uh, in the second edition was that um, she was talking about how photography influenced contemporary art, and she seems to have done that less so in this one. She hints at that, but that doesn't seem to be. Her. Her primary focus. That's interesting uh, to note because I was really just struck yesterday by the title and I felt that the title was so apologetic yeah, um, or offensive. trying to convince you but if if maybe previous um, editions of the book did make more ties to contemporary other media um, in contemporary art maybe that would have been it wouldn't have struck me so much the title. I feel like the title wasn't so apologetic as it was just specific um, because there's so many ways and places that photography is used that I feel like this title is just telling us, okay, we're going to talk about photography in this context that's, that's as opposed to. Too. Yeah, I agree with that. That I, I, I didn't really see it as apologetic. I think she would be attuned to that, you know, to, to that kind of history of photography um, but I think that what Paige said is kind of how I read it too, that photography is so ubiquitous in our lives in so many ways, but she's specifically focusing on, um, you know, the, the finer practice of photography rather than, you know, newspaper photos or, you know, the, the social media pictures or the myriad ways that photography exists in our lives. Uh, Pat, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that I felt like chapters five and six kind of broke down a little bit. And um, I, I found the rest of the book very interesting, but it seemed to me like in five and six, she was just more or less describing the works as opposed to really finding their place. Uh, did anyone else get that same feeling or did I just not give it the time I should have? I felt like she could have not had quite as many photographs there and maybe, uh, you know, uh, internalize what, she, you know, a fewer amount of photographs and it would have helped me a little bit. I liked um, the sections of the book where it wasn't just every new photograph, a different a different photographer, a different artwork. Um, wow. When she sort of gave over, you know, two, three, four paragraphs to um, sort of getting in the weeds with something in particular and exploring its symbolism and its significance, I felt, and I don't know how other people felt, it had been a while since I had read um, sort of a survey <laughs> book like this one and I felt a little overwhelmed. I felt like there was a lot sort of coming at me at once and that, uh, you know, by exposing me to a lot, I didn't actually 
feel like I, I got to appreciate individual artists and uh, artworks as much as I would have liked to. Did anybody else feel that way? I see some, yeah. some head nodding. I think the author kind of talks about that in introduction and, and, and sort of the, the, because this is a, a book, we can't see an unlimited number of pictures. And so she had to select, you know, usually just one, um, sometimes two images uh, to represent an artist or an idea. Um, so I know that that kind of has to happen when you're editing a book, but um, I think like Billy was mentioning, I did find myself um, reading this book next to my computer so I could uh, Google other images by the artist. But in those times when the author would talk about um, images that weren't in the book. And so mm -hmm. I know, again, it's hard to talk about just one image when there's so many great examples, I'm sure, of the ideas that she's talking about. But um, I did get a little frustrated when she would talk about something that I couldn't see. And so I would just have to take some extra time to look it up and try to understand what she was saying about uh, the larger uh, series of work or, or something like that. I mean, I think the book is less about individual photographers and more about her defining the, the sort of connections in the ways that they work and then how that shapes these different categories and each chapter is sort of a category. So it's really, it really is like a, a survey, but it's really kind of defining like what makes like these photographers practices and approaches relevant to one another is enough to be a kind of a genre of contemporary art photography. Yeah, go ahead, Joey. Prima is the third. I had the third edition, so unfortunately, yeah, that's yeah. It's a small book in size. It's only this big. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that made it very hard to see the photographs. Are this the chapters? This I mean, the same in terms of the eight categories? Are they? Well, like I said, I, I, I I'm only up to the third edition myself, so I'm going to have to get the fourth edition and you know get up to speed with it for future classes. There was a ninth uh, chapter oh. added. Uh, in the fourth edition that was about, I think it was called photographicness. And it was very much about uh, sort of the experimentation of contemporary photographers in line with um, sort of using Photoshop and using um, social media and using other sorts of digital ways of manipulating their work and combining photographic work with physical materials photo-based artworks and a lot of very sculptural, like kind of image-based sculptural artworks too. So I need to get that book. You need I to get the ninth <laughs> or the fourth edition. <laughs> or you can borrow this one. I'm more than happy to. It's going to go into the museum's library if you wanted to come and peruse it. Uh, any other uh, thoughts before we move on about the just your overall general impressions of the book or um, the author's sort of method of presentation? Well, Tim uh, kind of brought this up a moment, a moment ago, but one of the other things that I liked about this book were the categories that the author defines and uses um, as a context for which to talk about the various artists. Um, because I think maybe the, maybe the, I think it was history and photography or historical photographs. I forget the name. I think so it was mo six. Moments in time or something like that. That one was probably kind of a more traditional or, or used category, but these other ways of describing and categorizing the work like with deadpan and um, and the photographicness uh, to me were really interesting and ended up combining or talking about comparing artists that um, I haven't always heard compared or discussed before in, in more traditional um, categories. So that was really interesting to me to see these themes and the examples that she chose to, to talk about these themes. I did enjoy the themes. That was one thing that I really did like about the book because I think that when you're looking at survey books, they usually run very chronologically. You know, somebody comes after somebody comes after somebody, then this happens. And I enjoyed the fact that um, she organized sort of within themes or within types and then looked at it um, different types of examples within that. So while the, chrono the chronology was, you know, more or less late 
20th century and then the first two decades of the 21st century, she didn't necessarily have that very strict, you know, A, then B, then C, then D. Um, it was really just sort of um, incorporating the photographers and their work um, as it made sense to her discussion within the theme. I did enjoy that. All right, um, so I did have, um, let me put this back on the screen, this quote that I, that really struck me. Can you all see my screen there? Uh, in an era in which we receive, take, and disseminate, as well as tag, browse, and edit photographic imagery, we are all more invested and more expert in the language of photography than ever before, and we have a greater appreciation for how photography can be a far from neutral or transparent vehicle for bridged and framed moments of real time. Just thought that we could talk about this because I think that I know in the past week, especially, I've been completely bombarded with images and um, really thought about the way that it's not neutral, the way that they're presented, the way that they're framed, the, the way that they're interpreted, and that, you know, you and I can look at two completely different things and have co two completely different readings from it. So what do you all think about this idea? Hmm. Hmm. I, I totally agree with you, Christy. I think uh, some of us live in alternate universes and it's kind of uh, frightening. Um, I'm talking about what's happening in the world today, but I think the photography also, I, I enjoyed looking at the, the works, but I, I think each of us bring our own personal prejudices, feelings, and memories to each photograph that we look at, to images that we observe. Thanks, Barbara. Other thoughts? So, so what I think I hear you saying, and I would agree, is is that you can have a photograph, and the one that I think of in particular, the two uh, sisters or the two girls that, that are in the museum, hanging in the museum, and we discussed that on Slow Art Friday last week or the week before, or whenever, how we're all looking at this same picture, and we see different things, and the same thing can happen with photograph. Uh, and so to look at the photograph, and I must say, even as a docent, having, I've, I've never approached photography by saying first, what's going on in this picture? That's uh, a really interesting thought because photography, I think, has always, or maybe traditionally we think of photography as an objective representation of something yeah. or someone. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. There's no, you know, that's, there it is. And so I think this statement is, is I'm glad you pointed it out to me. Other thoughts? Charles, go, uh, just unmute yourself there. Can you unmute yourself, Charles? There I you go. I think I can. Hello, oh. good to see you, sir. It's been a while. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm always an outsider. Okay. As in, what's this? My training is usually not classified as art or the arts or even the humanities. Now, we can argue about that later. But, okay. One of the things that comes up whenever we're talking about photographs, even with, with, people in my field okay in general what you what you there is something in front of a device that you first squeeze it from three dimensions down to two dimensions you freeze a moment in time that is no longer changing unlike unlike, uh, unlike everything else everything is changing except now you've frozen a moment in time the colors never, ever match exactly. No matter what people do, if you set the, the image up in front of the actual object you were trying to record, it never matches. And then people talk about how the photograph is a representation of reality. 
So there's always some discussions we can have here about this, but it's been a while since I've had to deal with what I think is called, what, I, what we used to call brain breaking prose. Okay, whenever, whenever there's somewhere in the, in the text, anytime a word comes up like postmodernism, generally it's time to go get a cup of coffee. And Paige, I was gonna say, you did something I did not do that I should have done. Most of the works that she presented, or excuse me, a lot of the work she presented, this was one image in a series that the artist had been working on. Mm -hmm. So from the one image, we were supposed to get some idea of what the artist was trying to do. But that really is, you know, you're trying to encompass a universe with a split second, you know, small, uh, I wish I, well, this, the book is fine, okay, except when you find yourself doing this, trying to figure out what the image is really saying, there's a problem, okay. So there goes the other thing. You've, re you've reproduced the image in a book and you're trying to figure out well, what, you know, this is, why there, this is why there's still museums out there. So you can go actually look at the thing. And it, my impression is that one of the things that these contemporary artists were all doing is nobody was doing an eight by 10 representation or a four by six representation of whatever they were doing. But there's so many of these ubiquitous four by six things, et cetera, and all this, that anybody can discuss, well, you know, if I had a better camera phone, I could do what you were doing. And so I could see why the artist would, and the book itself could be a little defensive because everybody knows they could do whatever you were doing if they only had a device. And so- Or the idea. Or the idea. Once I got the idea, I could reproduce whatever you were doing. And so I can see why if you were an artist, the first thing you would do is never do a small representation. It would make it 20 by 20 feet, even if it's somebody's nostril. At that particular point, it's something that has separated itself from the commercial or your family explaining how, you know, they could have done that if they just remembered to pull out their phone and said. But, you know, mostly I tend to listen because I am trying, I am looking at it from the point of view of, I usually, I'm, I'm looking at what's there as opposed to this is a signifier that requires you to have so much cultural capital before you can even figure out what it's supposed to be. You know, there's, there's even people who've done studies talking about, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but if you show someone who has never seen one of these flat two-dimensional frozen moments in time, other cultures don't get it. They have to be taught that apparently. That's we good. take it for granted. That's a really interesting point, Charles. So um, Doris, uh, who's on the call with us today, there you are on my screen, um, led us one of our Slow Art Friday programs last Friday using three photographs from uh, our exhibition Vantage Points Contemporary Photography from the Whitney Museum of American Art. And I think, Tema, you were here yesterday to see the exhibition. Yeah, I saw I your name that. pop up on my screen. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting about that exhibition is that a lot of the photographs in the exhibition are really large. Mm -hmm. And even some of the ones that were, uh, there were a couple of the photographs, I think, from the exhibition that were reproduced in this book. And one of the things that I really want Wanted in this book um, were the dimensions of the artwork next to it because I think that in a lot of cases, um, especially um, I think in the deadpan section, she was talking about that these uh, photographers are using scale in order to tell a story about the things that were being represented or the people that were represented, yet they're all sort of tiny <laughs> in the book. And so I wanted, you know, without having to do a whole lot of flipping in the book, just that really little bit of extra information about the scale so that I could at least sort of imagine them in my head. Um, and so as I was going through, I was thinking, oh, you know, the Cindy Sherman picture where she is dressed mm -hmm. up as, you know, a 1980s, you know, Glamazon, 
is so small in the book, but it's, you know, really big and beautiful in the exhibition. And so you come on down to the exhibition to see these works in person, because I think scale was really important to a lot of these photographers. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Charles. Other thoughts about this idea of photography and the photographers um, not being as sort of a neutral or objective presenter? This might be jumping a little bit too much forward to one of your last questions about okay, photo, photojournalism, but yeah. I think that's a good example of how, depending on um, the, uh, the photographer's point of view and what exactly, what part of that scene they're shooting or how they're framing that picture, they can perhaps drive the narrative in um, a different direction from what another observer might um, interpret that scene. So, sorry, you know, yeah. like crowd crowd size uh, could be. You know, if you're showing um, a photograph of a, a, a crowd, uh, like for example, in if you chose to to publish the photograph of the crowd at the uh, ellipse, listening to the speakers, it would be a very different impression of what happened than a few moments later when they were kind of converging on the Capitol. So, mm -hmm. you know, what you're choosing, how you're framing it, um, what moment in time, even a portrait of someone's expression may change from one moment to another. And what you're choosing as your photograph, um, you can actually drive the narrative that way, I would think. No, I'm not a photographer, but I'm just, you know, just as a viewer of photographs. Um, yeah, I think you can, you can, drive the narrative if you if you want to. And I sort of lost my train of thought there when I was responding to Charles, but my point in sort of bringing out what you did in Slow Art Friday this past week, and we're going to have another Slow Art Friday with these Vantage Points ex, uh, exhibition photographs, is that uh, Doris and her uh, partner docent uh, spent at least 20 minutes on each of the photographs that we looked at and there were so many different readings and understandings and people seeing things that other people didn't and you know what you might consider you know pretty straightforward photographs of things uh, or people being represented or scenes being represented and just you know we could have spent a full hour on any of those photographs. And Doris said that after the program, people were emailing her and calling her because they wanted to keep talking about them. And so, you know, that to me is, you know, a really good uh, case in point for how different people see different things and images that, you know, on the surface might seem very straightforward at first. Um, did any of the sections of the book uh, particularly appeal to you? And can you share what sections those might have been? So the sections again were, mm -hmm. uh, is this art? Second, get the, mm -hmm. is this art? Once upon a time, deadpan, something and nothing, intimate life, moments in history, revived and remade, physical and material, and then for those of us with uh, the fourth edition, photographicness. <laughs> I really like chapter eight, the physical and the material. Okay. Um, just for my own uh, reasons, um, for my own practice, because as a photographer, I tend to be pretty traditional in my approaches. And I'm always really inspired um, and excited by artists that are are doing, you know, cameraless photos or um, any number of things that just are a less traditional approach. And when I say traditional, I mean like I go out into the world and wander around with my camera and hope to find and discover and capture something interesting that I want to share. And so seeing the, the processes that are less like that and, um, and more, um, I guess, more conceptual to use a sort of general word, are exciting for me, I, inspiring. I loved some of the photographs that uh, the photographers did in that chapter that were um, exposing photographic paper to water and um, or waves or things like that, uh, as you said, cameraless photography. Because remember, uh, photography, that word just means 
writing with light. So it doesn't say that a camera is necessary <laughs> to the process, although we usually use one, um, but sort of exploring all of the things of photography and, and what now is called, you know, the analog processes of using paper and chemicals and were they calling that wet photography, I think is what she started to call it towards the end. Other you thoughts? Know, this, Go ahead, might a, this might be a good time to remember to remind everyone that we do have an actual dark room. Yes, thank you, Tim. And it is wet um, most days, uh, at least it has <laughs> been, um, even if it isn't uh, uh, much right now um, for obvious reasons, but uh, the Asheville Dark Room does exist, and there are a lot, there will be again um, classes and sort of reminder classes and that sort of thing available. Still down uh, on the South Slope? At the moment, yes, as long as we can, as long as we can pay the bills, yes. Um, so uh, Asheville Dark Room, uh, it has a small membership fee every month for you to go in and use uh, the dark room. And I think that it includes everything but your paper. Is that right? So you, you can use yes. the, the uh, printer, the computers, the enlargers, the, yeah, the chemicals. They don't, have, um, they don't have a great scanner right now. And some other digital side is not real strong, but um, for traditional black and white, chemicals are there. Um, if you want to do cyanotype or other uh, historic processes, then um, that's a slightly different situation. But um, uh, anyways, so it is an option. And for those who would like to try it out and you want to experiment, um, it's a great resource. Thank you. I've, I've told Paige this before. The smell of fixer is something that my brain will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> Charles? Just information before we go on. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, this is uh, contact information. Okay. okay. So this 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 is normally, I can find this easily because the last time I went looking, it seemed like the uh, website hadn't been uh, updated for a while. For Asheville Darkroom? Yeah, so Asheville, I just look up Asheville Darkroom, right? Tim, if you get a chance, would you mind uh, putting maybe contact information in the chat box for folks? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Okay, so any other uh, thoughts about the sections of the book that you might have liked or appealed to you more than others? Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, you're muted, though. I like the creativity of the uh, we made, uh, what was it called? Um, we try to meet, we made we were, it was Cindy Sherman, maybe because I like her, because I, I thought that showed a real creativity, like taking the media and using it and, and saying a lot with it by manipulating. Um, I, I particularly love this one where they made this a uh, famous person, Zoe Leonard, and they created a whole persona at, of this lady. And um, I just thought that it was, showed a great deal of creativity, like taking, you know, using the media in a very different, uh, unusual way. You know, um, I mean, we, Charles talked about us looking at a pho photograph and taking it as straightforward, but these artists took it and used what we see and manipulated us to see a certain something. And I thought that was uh, very creative. Thanks, Barbara. I really liked the deadpan section. Um, it, you know, presenting sort of people and places um, sort of as they are um, to tell stories. And I also really liked uh, the section um, that had a lot to do with what Paige is gonna be teaching a class about, uh, I think in April. Uh, about mise-en-scene, so really manipulating uh, light and placement of objects, um, what your um, characters, because they really do become characters in your photograph, uh, are doing or wearing in order to tell a story. I'm very much attracted, uh, probably doesn't surprise any of you, to the storytelling aspects of photography, um, and so I really enjoyed the conversation that we had last Friday looking at three different mm -hmm. photographs from the exhibition because each one of them told a story. Now what that story was 
might have been different from person to person, but I loved sort of looking at those slowly and hearing what other people saw and finding what those stories um, in the photographs might have been. I found uh, chapter five, Intimate Life. Me, yeah, me too. Yeah. To be really offensive. Oh, offensive. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was, what did you find uh, offensive about it? I wasn't, well, it's creepy, uh, but I appreciated it because it was a good learning experience. And I really liked the, the questions that she uh, poses here. Um, who stands with whom? Who's mm -hmm. asking? Who's taking the picture? Why, well, who's taking the photograph? Uh, what may or may not be the purpose? And uh, I mean, for example, I'm, the, the photograph untitled of the woman having the guy inject something into her arm. Uh, mm -hmm. Rough. So I think one thing that she tried to make very clear um, in this chapter is that the people who were participating in those photographs were willing participants in them and had agency. And I, I think she was setting that up and letting you know that because of the fact that sometimes those pho photographs can look very voyeuristic. Um, and she wanted to make sure that, that you knew that they weren't creeping <laughs> the photographers but, but that the people that were being pictured were willing participants well, i think that some of the that begs the question to me why would anyone willingly be portrayed this way and so it was a good learning experience i mean i probably spent more time on this chapter because it was so offensive to me <laughs> than any other than any of the other chapters well good uh, on you billy for uh, making yourself sort of try and understand uh, rather than a flash I still, judgment i still think they're hideous <laughs> <laughs> that's fine Tema, i'm sorry i interrupted I you saying, i mean some of the photographers in that chapter are are very controversial photographers like Nan Golden, Larry Clark, Diane Arbit. I mean, th those photographers who are are photographing, you know, taking these very personal documentary photographs of these kind of subcultures that they exist within. It's messy work. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I, I think many of them are are often accused of being voyeuristic, and there's no you know, sort of simple read on that. And many of Nan Golden's subjects have been very uncomfortable later with her work mm -hmm. being exhibited. And Larry Clark's book Tulsa was banned until, you know, a couple decades ago, even when I was a, a student, like the book uh, was, you know, not a, not available because he, you know, he's photographing heroin addicts and uh, one of the parents of his subjects actually sued him. And so that book was banned actually for decades. So I think that's like the, that chapter, even when, when I'm sharing it with my students, sort of the apex for where these really like difficult questions about photography and the lifestyles that are being portrayed and the lifestyles of photographers. And, you know, they, they all have their, own, many of them have their own history, their own histories with drug use and addiction and even, going to jail, you know, in Larry Clark's case. So it is, there's a lot that comes up. So it's not surprising that it would make people uncomfortable. Right, mm -hmm. right. Joey, you had your hand. Going back, I'm sorry. Hold on, Doris. Yeah. Joey, uh, and then Doris. I'm, I'm sorry. It's like a pandemonium here with someone at the door, but I love that intimate uh, intimacy chapter, especially the man Golden, if that's her name, because I thought that their, her pictures were beautiful. They just, the way they were staged, the color she used, very intimate, though, and I wonder, now that you mentioned what you know about it, that the, uh, the, uh, the subject matters were a little upset with it afterwards. I, I just fell in love with her style. Mm. She is the one that I think it was Clinton, maybe, referred to her as Dan Golden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doris. Yeah, I was just going to comment that, um, you know, go, th that some of these photographs that we find kind of disturbing or a little like we're intruding on these people. I mean, that goes back to uh, Diane Arbus and um, and uh, we just did a Sally Mann um, in, in our um, discussion on Friday. So I don't think this is anything new that the subject matter may have gotten a little more extreme or, you know, given the times. But um, I think the idea of, you know, to, is the is this artist invading the privacy of the subjects, and is that appropriate? Is 
um, a question we've been grappling with for quite a while. Yeah. Charles? I don't think it started with photography though. You know, no matter what, what art form you're dealing with, there's always been a painting, a, a sculpture or something that some artist has done pushing back at whatever is happening was considered proper or improper for the society which they're dealing with. Yeah, that, I had trouble with that one too. Although I, I wanted to like that particular chapter. Some of them made me uncomfortable though, you know, cause you are talking about, are you showing yourself and the culture, subculture you're part of, or are you doing voyeur, I'm just look, I'm going to put these out there cause the, you know, because the regular culture will want to see these cause let's face it, looking at the other has always sold, okay? But, you know, don't forget, photog well, the art has been controversial for a long time. And, you know, people didn't like this painting because it did X. Okay. Yeah, what it showed point. or how it showed it. So. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Pat? Yeah, I was just going to say something that just floated in my mind as we're talking about this. With photography, we're more, we have a more intimate relationship because we've all had our photograph made. And like with painting or sculpture, we haven't all had ourselves painted or sculpted. And so I'm wondering if that affects, because I had trouble with chapter five as well. And that was one of the ones that I felt like she didn't quite give me enough information, you know. And so it just occurred to me as Charles was talking about the paintings, maybe it's purely because we have a more intimate relationship with the, the field of photography. And, and photographs, I think, mm, maybe the ones in this chapter put less distance between you and the subjects. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's more immediate for you to be able to understand a, a situation. Uh, what about just uh, on a more micro level, were there any photographs or photographers uh, in the book that particularly resonated with you as you were reading about them? I've always Did anything loved strike Cindy you in particular. Was that Pat? I just said I've always loved Cindy Sherman. <laughs> and it was really interesting that the one photograph that she chose to feature in this book is the one that's upstairs in the yeah. exhibition. Yeah. I thought that was kind of serendipitous. I like the William Eggleston. Um, uh, what page, Joey? I think that's in the well, see, I have the different no. It's like a, a little tricycle. It's like a very nostalgic picture of a tricycle with some mm. track homes in the back. And I, I, I don't know if that picture is in this edition. For you, what page is it on? It, it's on page 11 and it's, um, I, I can. Oh, okay, uh, great. Thank you for doing that, Joey. Let me yes, spotlight your screen. Hold on just one second. Uh, I, okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah. To me, it's very nostalgic, and it reminds me of, and I don't know if it's, this is in the um, vantage points. Does he have work in there? Because this looks like does, something. Yeah, quite a bit, actually. There, I oh, yes, okay, because it looks like that picture of the little boy in the red sweater that's standing on. Yeah, that one's one. actually in the show. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. A number of his most iconic images are, are included in the exhibition. There's quite, quite a significant uh, collection of his photos in the show. It's great. So it's like nostalgic. You know, this one was a 1970 picture. So to me, it just reminds me of a little early, later than my childhood, but it reminds me of my childhood. So I love his work. Thanks, Joey. Other folks have any favorite photographers or photographs from the book? Um, there are two artists, and I think it was the first chapter, um, uh, Shizuka Yoki, Yoko Mizo who did, um, who I had, I didn't know it before. And she 
um, photographed strangers. I think the title the series is called Strangers from uh, the Street Through Their Window. And she Page would just- 42. Yes. And she would, you know, just write these anonymous letters to people in these apartment buildings and ask them to stand in front of the window with the lights on at a certain time at night, with the, you know, the curtains drawn. And I, I really love this sort of connection between strangers and like the willingness to trust, you know, the, the, the people in the apartments to trust this unknown photographer to create these images together. And, um, and, and again, like the process not being like something I would traditionally do where she has this idea and then she has a process for the idea and then she kind of plays out the process and you get this, I'm gonna call it collaborative um, uh, uh, image making, um, which I thought was really cool. And I think in the same chapter, the author talks about Jillian Waring who also did portraits of people on the street um, and involved the people that she photographed um, the, the uh, respond to a prompt and write their answer on a, a card that was photographed with the person. Yeah, so I like the idea of the, again, the collaborative image making where there's not just like a photographer objectif objectifying a, a subject, but that it, um, that the relationship of creating the image um, is involving both involving people on both sides of the camera and really giving kind of a voice to the people in the photograph, at least with the Jillian Waring um, example. Thanks, Paige. Other favorites, Barbara? You're muted. I saw this in a CNN article this weekend and I thought it would fit in with the artist who took had the photographs in Times Square we took um, on, on people who didn't know they were being photographed. There's the this Philip Delorca, Corsha. Yeah. And now there's this uh, new book coming out by Jeff Mermelstein, and he's taken pictures, 12,000 or so pictures of people's texts on the subway and around New York. And he's making, it's like little snippets of their uh, conversation. And I thought it, it kind of fits in with some of the things that we, we've been talking about. So I thought it would uh, be interesting to mention it. It was like he catches something and then, you know, people can interpret it the way they want. Thank you. The, the one that I found to be most timely and, and interesting. What page is, is that, Billy? Page 104. I love Richard Miserac. Actually, just FYI, um, the series that uh, was mentioned there, the Border Contos uh, yeah. series, we're going to have that exhibition here at the museum, I think, next year. Oh, cool. oh wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, well, I found it, you know, just the whole, the segment of the, the wall with no, uh, no continuous. The freestanding border wall. Freestanding, <laughs> and, uh, and it has green grass under it. Mm -hmm. which I found to be, you know, this was one where I'd love to see this photograph larger, uh, as many of them. And then when you look at the tire marks around it and how it's surrounded, you know, a very interesting photograph. Thanks, uh, Billy, uh, for pointing that out. So, right, R Richard uh, Mizrak has been creating these photographs of these uh border regions and then Guillermo Galindo has been sort of taking found objects from those same regions and making um, I guess musical instruments out of them mm -hmm. and so that's going to be here as I said I want to say it's maybe next fall fall of 2022 don't quote me on that um, but it is sometime next year that that exhibition will be coming here to the museum so be happy to share that with you all and maybe that photograph is in the exhibition Billy and you can see it bigger <laughs> fingers crossed any other favorites from the book I was um really struck by I think it was in chapter one as well, Paige. Let me find it here. Uh, Nona Faustine from her body spring, their greatest wealth, mm -hmm. uh, where she was uh, sort of uh, had set up um, 
uh, a white white shoes uh, series where she took photographs of herself in white shoes. This particular mm -hmm. photograph, uh, it's on page 33, shows her uh, nude standing on a box in her white shoes, uh, looking at Wall Street and sort of really exploring uh, the history of Wall Street and that particular location as a place where enslaved people were auctioned. Um, I just thought that the the storytelling and the amount of symbolism that went into that, I thought that that was amazingly profound and thought provo provoking. It really struck me. And as I was reading the book, I kept thinking about this photograph. So I'd be interested <laughs> in learning more about that photographer's mm -hmm. work. Okay. So the, I want to get, uh, I think we've gotten through actually most of my questions. Um, and for those of you who are, who are photographers uh, in the group today, were there any particular photographers or photographs in the book that you found interesting, relevant to your practice or inspirational? Uh, inspirational, except for the problem that uh, we're currently in. Right. Can't do everything we want to do, Charles, right now. Well, the governor's just told me I can't I can't leave the house. Um, yeah. And with this in connection to the question before this one, mm -hmm. I just want to say that, you know, almost any head on portrait of an individual, you know, there, there's like five of them in here, including that one you were just talking about. Right. Yeah. You know, and I would love to be, you know be doing more portrait photography right now. So inspired, yes, we'll have to see, okay, what happens. So, um, but great stuff. Oh, uh, <laughs> slight aside, one of the pictures I just started laughing about is, okay, on page nine, the one where the diary of the Victorian dandy Yes, I was just right talking here. about that last night with someone okay. too. The first time I went through that was one thing, but my wife has gotten me hooked on Bridgerton. Yes, that was you the go, same oh thought I had. <laughs> and so, oh my goodness. <laughs> it it, takes, really it changes how I saw the photograph. Really so. in that, in that. Is that Joey? As a gay man, there are some really hot men in that uh, series. Agreed. Uh, so, right. So the photograph that you're talking about, Charles, is Yinka Shonabari and uh, his series, I think it's called A Dandy's Progress, mm -hmm. or sorry, Di Diary of a Victorian Dandy, where it um, is like William Hogarth's painting series, The Rake's Progress, but instead, mm -hmm. uh, Yinka Shonabari, who's a Nigerian-born British artist, places himself, if I can get my finger in the right place, yeah, there we go, it's so Close. hard when you're looking Close. at the screen, um, <laughs> within this uh, setting, and, uh, you know, I mean, we can talk about Bridgerton another time, but what I really loved about Bridgerton was, and this another series that I watched while I was home uh, over the break called Hollywood um, on Netflix mm -hmm. was decisions made to put uh, women, people of color, uh, homosexuals in these very visible places and the, the ripple effect that that could have had over history. Um, so I, I loved those two series that I watched on Netflix over my break because it, it really, I think, uh, started to present, a, you know, what if people had been brave? Would we, would the world be a completely different place? And I loved that. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Uh, any last thoughts? Uh, any of the other photographers want to share? Tema, was there anything for you that? Um, well, I mean, you? I, I think if the, the photographers that I would identify the most with in the book would be Eggleston or Alex So, for example. Um, but I, when I'm, for me, the, my interest in the book is not so much about what do I personally identify with, but more really expanding you know I, I i appreciate all different kinds of photography and for me it's a wonderful resource as a teacher to just you know share these different all different strategies and myriad of contemporary photographers with students so and and i've learned a lot from reading up like being exposed to 
um, new photographers that I didn't know ahead of reading that book. But um, yeah, so for me, the book isn't not as much about like where where do I where do I exist in that the book, but more like what do I learn about um, you know all these other. I have a pretty straight photography approach, but I'm you know interested in learning about these much more sort of conceptual approaches to photography. Thanks, Tim. Um, so Tim uh, did post in the chat box um, two links. Uh, one of them uh, was to uh, Asheville Darkroom. Thanks for doing that, Tim. And Tim also posted a link uh, in the chat to uh, the Six Feet Project, which originates uh, out of this area as well. Go check both of those out. Uh, before we close, I did just want to thank everybody for coming today. Always have a really great conversation about our book choices. Uh, next month, oh gosh, I should, Paige, would you mind pulling up next month for me uh, while I talk a little bit more about the exhibition so that we can let folks know the date, time, and title for next month. Uh, in the interim, I, I wanted just to um, make sure that you knew that today's book was chosen um, in relation to our current exhibition, Vantage Points Contemporary Photography from the Whitney Museum of American Art on view in our Explore Asheville Exhibition Hall through March 15th, 2021. So please do uh, come down and see that exhibition. Um, and Paige, what is next month's book choice? Do you have that pulled up? Let me unmute myself. Um, that would be uh, Tuesday, February the 9th, Hidden in Plain View. A Secret Story of Quilts on the Underground Railroad by Jacqueline mm. Tobin and Raymond DeBard. So join us for that. Thanks again, everybody. Always a pleasure to see you. Great discussion today. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Take you. care, everybody. Take care.